Okay, so this week's class, we take the idea of maximum likelihood, and we're going to pivot it to defining those core functions, the PDFs, to not involve just one variable, but to involve, to involve multiple, multiple. So we want likelihood functions that are multivariate, uh, because this is a multivariate statistics class. And so in the process of working our way up to multivariate statistical methods, one of the things that we have to get through is something called a multivariate normal distribution. But unfortunately, the multivariate normal distribution is just usually described in a language that is not something we use in a regression of ANOVA, and that language is nature's algebra. So in this lecture, I'm going to give you a quick tour of matrix algebra. And I'm, my goal with it is to give you a little bit of the terms that go behind the map that shows up in papers and textbooks and so forth dealing with multivariate normal. So it's more only, mainly motivated by, by, by multivariate normal. So what you're thinking probably is why multivariate normal, right? Because ma multivariate normal runs the world uh, for like m the vast majority of statistics that we use. Now those of you taking Billy's IRT, that's not multivariate normal. But everybody else, if you're going to do uh, multivariate ANOVA or repeated measures ANOVA or multi-level models, or structural equation models, or confirmatory factor analysis mo models, all of those are multivariate normal based. So if that describes some or all of what you do, that's going to apply to you. Um, so that's, that's where we're headed. Um, how are we doing, by the way? Thank you for coming here, uh, coming back. I, I do like to appreciate your effort. I will tell you, if you are working hard on homework, uh, thanks. I'm hope that the extension was fair. I couldn't make office hours yesterday, so um, gave you some extra time. I know I got sick right when everybody started emailing me about homework, so hopefully that will resolve those of you who are emailing me and whatnot. But do I do encourage you if you can make office hours to do so. If you can't, email me. At least work with me over email to try to get your answers solved. Um, if you can do interactions, I really feel like that's the, the thing that takes the most effort in this course. Like concepts that we talked about today are different, and sure, we can make them all difficult, and I'm trying not to. I'm trying to focus them more on what we do, but I do believe that I, my feeling is that this interaction part is the toughest, and that's the thing that's going to carry with us when we get to multivariate models. And, and if you can do interactions, you really set yourself apart, not only in, in research, but also in um, understanding what other people are doing in research. So um, if you're struggling with the homework, uh, listen, I would struggle with it too if I were in your shoes. So don't worry about that. Uh, but just realize that every time that you have interactions involved, it takes a lot of thought and a lot of, a lot of head space. It's not something I can do. I can't like have music on while I'm doing it. I've got to like focus. But maybe you can. I don't know. Maybe you're better than me. Maybe, how many of you listen to music while you're doing it? Okay, so you're better, Michael. You're better than me. No, I, no. that's how I think. Oh, that's how you think. Okay, that's good. I'm just trying to give you some like props here. Hey, you could do it with music. You're better off than I am. I can't even like have music on. All right, it just distracts me too much. So. Oh, white noise. White noise. Uh, okay, I appreciate. I can. I can see that. I can see not with lyrics, mind you. No. Oh, not lyrics. Oh, so this is all lyricless. Okay. Oh, okay. So, so maybe that's my definition of music. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just messing with you. Um. Okay, so, so I, 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 I'm trying to tirelessly motivate why we're doing everything in this class because it is a little bit different. Um, the matrix algebra that you're going to see from me is very much different this time that I'm teaching it uh, from when I first taught it. So you can even go to my slides back when I was fresh out of grad school. They're all on my website. You can find the multivariate class from 2005, the first class I was a professor for. And you could go look at the matrix algebra for it, and it is way more like stuff in it and thorough and whatnot. And again, me looking at that was like, what was the point? A lot of this we don't use anymore. So this is streamlined to try to fit in with what we use. Uh, but if ever you're to the spot where you're like, why are we doing this? Please ask. I want to try to motivate. Everything that's in this class is here for a reason. I want to, I want to explain that to you why. I don't want to lose you on that uh, because I do find it to be important. So, today, 
matrix algebra, uh, scalars, vectors, and matrices, uh, basic and advanced matrix operations, and all of this in R. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? This is just the class that you go to where you're like, yeah, it's just going to be a blast. We're going to do some, some scalar stuff, some vector stuff. So why is matrix learning a little matrix algebra important? I emphasize a little. See, as an undergrad, when I knew I wanted to do quant stuff as a grad student, I, I had a professor that encouraged me to email you know, grad programs and their professors and say, what should I take my last year? And many of them said, take a matrix, al al matrix algebra class. So I did, and I only take one semester, I took two. Oh my goodness, there's a lot of stuff that I will never use from it, right? But here's where. Uh, so it's, it really is sort of the alphabet of statistics when you get past um, univariate stats. And even for a good part of univariate stats, it shows up quite a bit. Uh, if you're going to do something, if you're, if you're going to be doing research and maybe, or consuming research, and you're going to plan on doing that as a career, then more often than not, new methods will come along as you go forward. So uh, this is actually brings up a point. There are many who feel statistics is done. There's not actually a field. But believe it or not, it's a living, breathing, evolving field like the rest of us. And there's new methods that are brought out every, 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 every month, every year, right? It's, it evolves. And eventually, one of those new methods will be something you'd like to try with data. Or there's a, some research study making some claim that you'd like to evaluate that use those new methods. So to understand the new methods, you're going to have to be able to read a little bit about it. And matrix algebra is oftentimes what the methods are written in. So here are a couple of snippets. Imagine you're interested in analyzing some repeated measures data. And you've heard, hey, uh, mixed models. They do great if you have some cases missing. In fact, they're a little bit. Uh, more broad in terms of assumptions than least squares would be for repeated measures. So you pull up and you think, okay, well, SAS has this proc mix, mix is in the title. Let me go see what it's all about. And this is what it gives you, right? All right this is a, a snippet of their manual for how to use the software. And it's kind of like, they're like, yeah, this is the background. Right? It immediately starts with a matrix equation, right? Or you see things like this right here prime and negative one and all sorts of weird stuff. By the way, we're going to come to know that thing pretty soon. This is normal because there's two pi in it, right? Normal distribution. So if you're in that spot, matrix algebra will help sort of get you through this. Now, it doesn't make it easy. Don't get me wrong. Like why this happens to be the case, um, ooh, it's a mess. But at least trying to understand what's going on with it is where we're going with this. So, so nearly all of our multivariate stat techniques are described with matrix algebra. There have been some people, um, some of the professors I had, made claims that said that um, we didn't get better at statistics until we really got good at matrix algebra for notation. Right? So it's like taking lots of things and doing them all at once, which is essentially what multivariate statistics is about. It's multiple variables analyzed all at once. So this matrix algebra is essentially the, the mathematical literature or, or language that goes with it. Uh, so here are a couple matrix forms that you might see. This first one, x transpose x inverse x transpose y. Anyone seen that? Yeah? No? Where have you seen it? It's part of my calc class. Part of your calc class, that's good. <laughs> Those of you who don't know Billy, I'm sure making him out to be a bad, evil person. That is your formula that gives you your fixed effects in least squares. Got people nodding. All right. No, that is something where actually Billy and I talked about future of 905 and what I do and what he does is, oh, you're going to spend like four weeks on matrix algebra, right? And teach them x transpose x inverse x transpose y. There, I taught it to you. No. Um, that thing is, um, that's how we get our fixed effects, right? That, that one equation. When you were in uh, regression class, did you have to rem memorize equations? It's always interesting to know which classes do what. As an undergrad, did you ever have to memorize equations in stat class? All right, so you had a, there was always an equation for the slope of a regression. 
and there was an equation for like the intercept, right? That equation does every slope intercept and interaction you'll ever want to have, right? That's like the general equation for it. So there. Yeah. I, I did teach it that way once when I was here at KU and I made a deal with the students. They wouldn't have to memorize any equations if they can remember what this did. But you're not going to have to do that. Again, just making the point that there's matrices. Anyone seen this one? Lambda phi lambda transpose plus psi. You better have Alan, Jennifer. Anybody seen this? What is it? Devane's nodding. Walter's I've nodding. Seen, I've seen it. I cannot recall the top of my head. How about Jennifer? You know? Messy, I'm right now. Oh, there we go. Alan? <laughs> ah, Chan Chan. Uh huh. I'm trying to think here. It's the. Uh, uh, who else was it? Haisha? No. All right. This is the, um, if you have a confirmatory factor analysis model, this is the, what it tells you the covariance matrix should be for your data. Right? This is by assumption. So how many of you have done confirmatory factor analysis? Nobody. Oh, one. One person willingly admits it. Nobody else? That's fine. How many people have fudged their data? <laughs> one fewer. <laughs> so one, one. so uh, the, uh, that one, that shows up anyway. The other thing about it is, if you were, at the very least, if you're at a bar somewhere and someone wants to talk to you that you don't want to talk to, start talking about matrices. It usually just shuts <laughs> that down quick. Have you, had, have, you used, have you used statistics to get out of conversations before? I have. I've also had it backfire. I remember being at a bar once, and a person started talking to me, a dude, and he's like, I don't know, it was just something. He's like, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I do statistics. Oh, great. I'm, a, I'm, I'm getting my PhD. I need some help. <laughs> I wouldn't help him, and he nearly tried to fight me at the bar. I'm like, so, bad idea. Airplanes, it's also good. What do you do? Statistics. Oh, shuts it down. So, Matrix algebra on top of statistics. Oh, I do multivariate statistics. Matrices. Easy, easy to get away from deep conversation. I like this. Uh, here's some different definitions. What is matrix algebra? Because at least when I started, I'm like, what is matrix algebra? What the hell is that? I had a hard time with matrix. Like, when I took uh, matrix algebra, it was about the time when that movie, The Matrix, came out. <laughs> right? And I'm not a big sci fi person. I have to tell you that. And so I heard The Matrix is a movie and it's sci-fi. I'm like, oh, I want nothing to do with Matrix anything, right? I've come to, been. I, someone made me watch it and I enjoy The Matrix. That's fine. I, I'm, I'm less, less anti-sci-fi these days. But I hear me. <laughs> I remember my first reaction. I was like, what? I don't want anything to do with that. Okay, so Matrix is a box and it's got numbers in it. That's basically it, right? It's a rectangular array of numbers or algebraic quantities, like symbols, like x and y and so forth, represent numbers, that uh, we do math on. That's the second part, subject to mathematical operations. Uh, or, uh, and I like this quite a bit, this is from dictionary.com from a few years ago, uh, the substrate on or within which a fungus grows. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you're going through this and you're thinking we're learning matrix algebra, just think it could be worse, right? <laughs> Algebra, um, so again, I think I mentioned this to you before. I'm, I was a terrible math student in high school, right? And um, I, I don't know if I mentioned, I, so I failed, I failed several, I got an F in Algebra 2, got a D minus in pre-calculus. I should have failed geometry before that. It was terrible, I almost dropped out of high school. I got to community college in Sacramento, California, and um, it was either you had to take a business calculus class, it was like, oh no, or you have to take statistics, right? And so you take statistics, and uh, you, you don't have to take math anymore. So oh, okay, I'll do statistics. And at that point, that was where I was like, I love, I love doing this. I needed to learn math, and so I did lots of math. But anyway, it jogged my memory to think, what the hell was algebra? I, no, I don't really know if anyone thought about that. I remember like when I got to seventh grade, algebra was there was a, something like you know y equals x plus one, and I was thinking, is that 
is that W X Y? Is that Y itself? Is it like is it one letter away in the alphabet? I mean, like what the heck does that mean? But generally, it's <laughs> <laughs> like that doesn't compute, right? Like circle plus square doesn't equal triangle, right? It just doesn't doesn't work. But it is algebra is a branch of mathematics where we use symbols, usually letters of some alphabet, to represent numbers, and that coupled with a pair of binary operations. So what we do in algebra, like multiplication or division or subtraction or addition, something like that, uh, usually get defined on the set. Uh, and so in addition to the letters and symbols and these operations, we also have a couple other key definitions. One is the identity. Again, jogging my memory, the number one, that's a pretty awesome number, right? Uh, and then something like a zero, that's an awesome number and then some of the associate, commutative or associative operations. So algebra, well, basically if we put this together, we're going to take boxes of numbers, represent them with symbols, and do algebra with them. And for the most part, the algebra seems pretty straightforward. There's a few bits of algebra that starts to get a little wacky, and that's where we have to sort of slow down and, uh, and think a little bit about it. So. So I'm still here motivating, like, come on, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. Um, I really think this is important to understanding how stats work, uh, to evaluate when to use them or if you should, uh, to understand what the methods mean. So what does it mean when someone says, oh, yeah, I had an AR1 covariance structure? Right? There's usually a matrix product for that. What? Huh? Okay. Well, what does that mean? and uh, how to interpret results or read or, or even write about them. So, so we're going to start with a data example. And for this example, I have um, data that I somehow collected uh, that we're supposed to represent SAT scores for the math and verbal SAT uh, for a thousand students. So I generated these data randomly. And uh, here are the descriptive statistics. The mean for each is right about 500. The standard deviation for verbal is 50, right about. For math was 81.2. And there's a correlation of 0.78. Now, I don't show you the covariance, but you know you can take the correlation and multiply it by the product of standard deviations and get the covariance. But uh, I won't do that. So here's numbers in Excel. That's actually SAS. No, that's R itself. And if I flip over to R, try to play along with this. That's a bad idea. Let me just pull up my HTML page. I'll play with the R markdown here. You can find these numbers in R itself, but I'm going to highlight a few things on here, although it's really hard to read, uh, of code because this code will come in handy. Homework 2 is up, not to scare you. It doesn't involve interactions. You're better on that. It, there's a set of questions that ask you to do matrix algebra with R, and then there's a set of questions that are just multiple choice options afterwards, right? So it's not, I don't think homework two is going to be as labor intensive as homework one has been, uh, but that's my thought. I, again, I'm, I'm in that phase of the career where I, I'm less and less like a student and more and more like an old professor, so it's, you know, when you, when you first start out, you remember learning it, and as you get older, you forget what it was like to learn it, so I'm still trying to, to be there. So, I, but I do think um, I'll show it to you in just a bit once we get a little bit further. So, going back to here, we're going to start off with some definitions. Uh, here's a matrix. A matrix is a rectangular array of data. Uh, it's used for storing numbers. That's all it is. Right. So, um, for our purposes, our matrices are going to have two dimensions. Basically, we're going to have a set of rows and a set of columns. And if you're familiar with SPSS or Excel, this looks like a spreadsheet, right? If you're cool with that, that's awesome. Matrices can have more than two dimensions, right? Which would be like having a, multiple spreadsheets in an Excel table or something like that. We're not going to touch those, right? We're just going to work with two. Um, so, the matrix itself, in notation, to, de to denote a matrix, uh, oftentimes, I mean, notation varies from text to text, but typically speaking, we denote a matrix with capital letters that are in bold. 
All right, so capital X in boldface font represents a matrix of observations. So in this case, if we were to take all of our SAT verbal and SAT math scores and put them in two columns, we, would, we could call this whole thousand by two box the matrix X. Okay? How are we doing so far? So the size of a matrix is always given in rows by columns. And size uh, in matrices is very important because this some operations are governed by certain sizes aligning. Right. So we would say this matrix is size 1,000 by 2. Right? So there are 1,000 rows and two columns. And we always say row by column in terms of size. Right? So that's it. That's a box of numbers. That's the matrix. They made a movie about it. Did I just summarize? Is that a good synopsis? <laughs> Me and Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> uh, a vector. Oh, that sounds, uh, uh, to me, that sounds uh, unnecessarily technical, doesn't it? Like vector, really? But a vector um, has a number of representations. But in terms of a matrix, that what we can talk about, a, ve a vector is a matrix where one of the dimensions has size 1. Right? So this we were to look at the very first column of our data, which was SAT verbal, that would be called a column vector. Right? It would be a size 1,000 by 1. And uh, the way we would denote it is with a lowercase bold-faced letter. Right? So lo little x in bold says that's a vector itself. Now the subscript on it is a little bit different. The dot 1 means this is the first value, all, the dot means all of for that dimension. So this says all of the rows, and the one says the first column. Right? So that says the dot notation you'll, you won't see as, as often because it's, it's not as common where we just take little parts and pieces, but in different math texts you will definitely see that. So x dot one says all of the rows and the first column. That's a column vector. Alternatively, we see x one dot that says take the first row and all of the columns. So x1 dot is a row vector. And the size of the row vector, in this case, is 1 by 2. One row, two columns. Okay. So those are do both different vectors, both different ways of describing data. And what you're maybe thinking right now is why, what does this mean? All right, there ultimately going to be used in contextually based methods. So if we were interested on, in certain properties of a variable, right, we would be interested in working with a column vector. And so if we were to create a, uh, a variable mean, it would be based on x dot 1. Whereas similarly, if we were to talk about working with a person, we'd be working with a row vector. And now we'd be working with x1 dot if we wanted to come up with a person mean or a person variance or something along those lines, right? So it's, it's, it's uh, why we choose to work with what depends on the problem and, and kind of the context within what it, where it happens to be. Just the, the entity itself is called a vector if it's a one dimension, in, if it has, has a value one in one of the dimensions. So <clears throat> vectors are bold-faced font text with lowercase letters, and the dots describe what we just talked about there. Questions? Matrix elements. So the individual numbers themselves are called elements of a matrix. And typically, we see an element without, because it's just a single number, it's no longer bold-faced. But element x, i, j would come from row i and column j. So if we were looking for um, uh, x, 1, 2, that would be the value of 580, which is in row 1 and column 2. Right. So, just a way of labeling. Yes. So is it Adam? Yeah. Yeah. If it's a lowercase letter in bold and it has two subscripts, that's a matrix in a first row and column. But if it's a lowercase letter and it's not bold, that's a value. <laughs> that's a value. That's right. You got it. And that value is actually called a scalar, a single number. 
That's right. So lowercase boldface is a vector of some sort. Lowercase plain font, scalar. Right. Uh, so here we have it. So, so each element is a just a single number. A single number, you just would call that a number up until matrix algebra, because but because matrix algebra is its own thing, a scalar has a set of representations. A scalar, um, the 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 word scalar, you can think about what is what it, does it mean to scale something? Generally speaking, uh, in the language that we use in uh, well, in psychometrics even, it, it, it's a value that will either make something longer or make something shorter, right? And that's what's going to happen. When we get a little bit further, actually in a few slides, we're going to see that vectors have a very specific geometric interpretation, right? They do describe a distance. And when we take a scalar and multiply that by it, it's like lengthening or shortening the distance. And so that's where the term scalar comes into to play. So each element of a matrix is a, is a scalar, and the scalar is written without boldface font. How are we doing? So matrix is a box. Vector is either a row or a column of the box. Uh, an element is a number in the box. And a scalar is an element, or is a number altogether outside of the box by itself. All right? All right? Fun times. It feels like it's time for a break. <laughs> <laughs> is it as fun to learn it as it is to teach it? I don't know. Never thought it. <laughs> you want to trade? I think we did. <laughs> All right. So the first matrix operation I'm going to tell you is something called the matrix transpose. The matrix transpose is an operation where we say, if we say X t capital T, Sometimes we put a prime there, but in the way I do notation, I like T that says transpose of X. That means for every element in X, we have changed the row and column position and switched them. All right? So we have this long 1,000 by 2 matrix. We're going to switch the row and the column position and get a very wide 2 by 1,000 matrix. Right. So... For every x, i, j in our original matrix, now in x transpose, it's x, j, i, in terms of row and column position, right? So 550 was here in position row 2, column 2. 550 will still be in row 2, column 2. Switches them. 520 was in row 2, column 1. It's now going to be in row 1, column 2. And this accountancy that we're doing here, which row and which column, that an element appears in is sort of important because one of the biggest operations that involves figuring out which row and column is important is matrix multiplication. You have to have the, the same number of columns in one matrix as you have rows in another. So oftentimes we see the matrix transpose involved in products of matrices. And it's really to sort of make the math work out the right way. Not that exciting, though. We've taken a box and shifted it, right? So there are different types of matrices that are uh, important for our class. The first is a square matrix. Probably can guess what that is. It's a matrix where the box is equal height and width, right? Number of rows equals number of columns. And you've seen square matrices before if you've looked at the correlation matrix, the number of Variables in your data is number, the correlation matrix is variables by variables, right? Same thing with the covariance matrix as well. So it's a square matrix. Um, a diagonal matrix is a special type of square matrix. It's a square matrix where numbers appear only on the diagonal itself and zeros appear otherwise. So in matrix language, we'd say, x i j equals zero for i equal to is not equal to zero for i equal to j, right? So when i equals j, i equals j, that means the row and the column are equal. Right, the index, so that's in position one one, position two two, position three three. Right, that would be what happens. 
and the off-diagonal elements x, i, j equals zero for i not equal to j. That's every every place out of here. So, if you have a covariance matrix and you want to create a correlation matrix from it, we can actually do so with a pre and a post multiple of a diagonal matrix. I'm going to show you that in just a few minutes. All right, so diagonal matrices are helpful in uh, what we do in multivariate statistics because oftentimes the algorithms we use give us covariances, yet our description will often depend on correlation. So that is where we see them. So again, just another definition. A lot of definitions so far, huh? How we, how we do yet again the most fun class. And it's is it still hot in here to you? It feels no, okay. It feels warm. Maybe it's just the type the topic. <laughs> yeah, it's warm. This is stuff you don't want to teach. No. Um, so finally, a symmetric matrix is the last one of the last definitions we're gonna have. A symmetric matrix is a square matrix where all the elements on the lower triangle, right? So this little part that's below the diagonal are reflected across the top, upper triangle of the matrix itself, right? So if we were to do this mathematically, we'd say each element A, I, J, right, is equal to element J, A, I, count A, J, I. So here, row, this, this diagonal matrix is a, is a symmetric matrix. All the zeros down here match the zeros above. If we think about it, A, 2, 1 is equal to A, 1, 2. Right, A two three is equal to A three two. Sorry, three two three one is equal to A one three. Uh, three two is equal to A two three, and so forth. Um, so we've worked with symmetric matrices before. A correlation matrix is a symmetric matrix. A covariance matrix is a symmetric matrix. If you're into, uh, we're not going to cover it in this class, but sometimes you've heard of it. Multidimensional scaling. It's based on distances. If you can create something called a distance matrix, it's a, it is a symmetric matrix as well. So those are the types of matrices we'll see. Okay, let's get a little bit deeper into vectors. <laughs> vectors in space, <laughs> even better. Uh, so vectors, either row or column, depending on whatever you want to define them as, can be represented as lines on this graph, which is what we'll call a Cartesian coordinate system. So if we have a vector A that's uh, value 1, 2, that would be like saying in the x dimension, that value is 1, and the y dimension, that value is 2. So if we put a, top, a dot there, the vector would represent the line that goes from 0, starts at 0, emanates from 0, and terminates at the dot itself. Similarly, 2, 3 would represent a line that goes from 0 and goes out to the point 2 values over on the x dimension and 3 values up on the y dimension. Okay. So far, so good? So those are two-dimensional vectors, and we can plot them. But here's a question for you. Right? We have column vectors in our example, SAT math and SAT verbal. Right? What's the size of those? Thousand by one, they're vectors. Just Each yeah, the matrix X. No, you got it. You're good. You're close. You got a thousand. That's good. A thousand by one. How would you plot a one thousand by one vector? If you answered you wouldn't, that's a good answer. <laughs> right. Right. So here's two dimensions. If we were to add a third dimension, it'd be like this Z that comes out from the screen. And we'd have a, a dot, you know, that would go from zero out to somewhere here in space. The fourth dimension, I guess we could sort of plot with movement somehow. I don't know how that would be. A thousand dimensions, right? That's where visual parts of it start to go away. But in vectors, I want to just repre I want to think about them geometrically a little bit because they start to define things that we hear occasionally, or just a different way of looking at them. But really, we're talking about doing operations on this one thousand dimensional surface. I see the looks. Everybody's like, oh, right? What's that? Well, we can't draw it, but some of the same interpretations of these will hold. So, for instance, one thing we could ask is, what is the length of this first vector? 
right? And if you remember, here we go, down the math path, rabbit hole here, right? Remember tr trigonometry? <laughs> this forms a right triangle with the axis here, and we could go use the, what was that thing called? The Pythagorean theorem to figure out the length of that thing. We could do that with this vector. We could do that with that vector. We could talk about the lengths of vectors. Sure enough, lengths of vectors are going to be related to variances. What? Right. Furthermore, we could talk about angular relations of vectors. Right? We could talk about how closely this one vector parallels this other. Right? That's going to be related to correlations. Believe it or not. Right? We could also talk about, this is getting a little bit worse, if we were to, in two dimensions, shine a light down on this vector, it would have a projection onto another one on this other one right here, like a perpendicular line making a right triangle of it. This, this right here. That's related to regression, right? So each of these terms that we get in a geometric sense are related to all the stat terms we've been talking about with vectors in themselves. It's just really hard to see that all of those things I just mentioned exist in thousands of dimensions, right? We can talk about the length of the vector that's a thousand dimensions. We can talk about the angle between vectors at a thousand dimensions. That still helps us. And in fact, we've been doing that already in what we do. Okay, how are we doing? A little weird. By the way, you're not getting quizzed on this geometric stuff. It's, it's, it's one of those hit or miss things. I've always found like one or two students who are like, yeah. And then the rest of the world's like, no. Right? <laughs> like, and my wife, <laughs> she, she's, she's uh, you know, we, we, we helped design this thing together. And as I was, uh, under the weather earlier this week, she's like, well, I can teach for you. And I was, she's like, what's the topic? I'm like, well, it's the, uh, you know, this vector thing. She's like, oh, I, I, I can't teach her. I don't do geometry, right? So, like, she's the, one of the most brilliant pe persons, people I've ever met. And she's like, no, not for me. I don't do geometry. All right, but just, so I'm just trying to give this to you to provide a little bit of context with it, okay? Okay, so here's vector length. Vector length itself, we just described the vector length could come from the Pythagorean theorem, right, which is, oh gosh, <laughs> right. the, the, the square root of the square of each of the values, right? So the vector length here, we can come here uh, and say this, this, this vector length, uh, if we wanted to see it, if we took every one of the elements and squared them, summed them together, and came up with uh, the square root of that, that would be the length of a vector. This is also called the Euclidean distance of a vector. You may hear this also in certain multivariate uh, conversations. And oftentimes we denote that with a double bar in front of the value of x, although in a lot of statistics we don't denote that at all. We don't see this too often. Uh, so the distance of the first vector was 2.24 in the last slide, and the second vector was 3.61. Um, in our data, you can see the distance here, it's a lot larger, but that's because it's a thousand dimensions, right? So it should be a lot longer. <coughs> but uh, the length itself of a vector is an analogous to the standard deviation. How about that? All right? It's, it's, uh, if you took each of your variables and mean-centered them, all right, it is close, but not quite, the standard deviation. So that's, that's that. And if I flip over to this in R, the things I should be going along as I do this, the matrix language in R is built in. And you know, that's, I changed the scaling. <laughs> see, can you see this? <laughs> no, of course not. I can't see it. Uh, let's see if I can make this bigger here. Is this a little better? Okay, so in R, the matrix language, um, when you read in a data set, it doesn't by default define it as a matrix, but you can convert it to a matrix using some type of matrix operation. So here, I define the matrix X with something called C bind. That stands for column bind. And so what it's looking for is taking, I took a column vector here from my data set, I have SAT verbal, SAT math, and 
I put them into this columbine function that treats this as a column vector and this as a column vector and glues them into a matrix. Okay. So if I wanted to talk about, um, let's see here. Go down to the bottom. If I wanted to talk about a given column of X, once I have my data in this matrix X, the way R works is very much like we notate things. It uses a bracket notation. So here in X, if I refer to in brackets, uh, the way it works is rows, comma, columns. So if I omit one of the indices, it's like saying the dot notation from before. It's like saying take all of this index. So here, X nothing comma one says take all the rows and column one of my data, matrix X. So let me uh, show you here. This is X. This is our this is our matrix X. It just looks our, like our data set, although it, it kind of relabels the columns. It's a matrix. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily know it different than a data set, and most most of the times data sets and matrices in R work the same, but not always. But uh, this little X column code here then would create a column vector. So it will be the first column of X and all the rows, right? So this is going back over some of the slides we already talked about, but I, need, I want to show you this. So similarly, if I were to put a one in the very first position and the comma and nothing in the second, it would say, take the first row and all of the columns, right? So this will be the very first row of the data matrix so here, this is now this thing. Now you'll note, I wanted it to be a row vector and R decided to make it a column vector. And that's one of the funky things with R that drives me nuts. <laughs> it should be a row vector. But uh, I've tried to, I'm in the homework starter file this week, I've, I've made it, so there's, there's a part where you have to take the first row of data and do stuff to it, I put that code in for you already. So you don't have to worry about remembering this code. This is more conceptual, understanding what, what matrices are. Uh, so here, this next to the code, this is like saying, I'm going to take create a variable SAT verbal. It's going to be the first column of X, all the rows. SAT math is the second column of X, all of the rows. And if I wanted to show an element of it, I would just put numbers specifically in each of the spots. So X102 would be observation 10, or row 10, column 2. Right. So here, that's value 470. Doesn't really have much more meaning than that. X11 would be value, row 1, column 1. One thing that you will need to use in homework, though, is the transpose function. If you want to take the transpose of a matrix, remember the transpose, it is change, interchanging row with column, right? It's taking our 1,000 by 2 matrix and changing it into a 2 by 1,000 matrix. The way we do that is to take the matrix and put it into this T function, T parentheses. I think I found using T, it's such a, how many other functions in R are one letter, right? So it's how, so kind of underscoring how often transpose gets used in matrix algebra. But we do that, you'll see our X transpose matrix is very wide now, right? That thing goes very wide. Okay, so when we're playing with vectors, this is that slide I just did, we're going to create two matrices, uh, the 1, 2, and the 2, 3, these are vectors actually. And so we had vector A, 1, 2, it was 1, 2, and vector B was 2, 3, you see both of those there. Uh, and here, we could take the length of A and B using the sum of A squared. So the square function goes and squares each of these elements in this vector. The sum, sums it up, the square root takes its square root, and that just tells us its length. Similarly, I did the same thing with our data to produce the last result that we saw there, All right, which was 
the length of our vectors, which is analogous to the standard deviation. Not exactly, but analogous. So far, so good? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to go back and forth a little bit more now. First, let me go over here. There we go. All right. So the first thing that we're going to learn about vectors is how to add them together and what that means. Vector addition is very much like scalar addition, right? It works element by element, right? So if we were to go and add vector A to vector B, it would be like adding each element together to create a brand new element in vector C. <coughs> so A and B, there are a couple rules that we have to remember about addition. To do element by element addition, we have to have the same size of vectors. So A and B have to have the same number of rows and the same number of columns. And what we get out of that is a vector that has the same number of rows and columns that A and B both had. Right? So that therefore it's just the same dimensional thing. So here, if I were to do that in R, Uh, it will work. It's just A plus B, it looks like regular math, right? However, if A or B was not the right size, R would yell at you. It would say matrices do not conform to the right dimensions or something along those lines, right? So, but A plus B gives us this vector 3, 5. Similarly, in statistics and data, in data analysis, uh, the SAT Particularly with SAT, a lot of times people talk about coming up with a total. That's just summing two vectors together. It's not all that different. So we can come up with SAT total and see it is the sum of SAT math and SAT verbal. So that's, it's not it's not what you it's not all that complicated. Just the thing you have to note: this is the first instance where we have to remember the vectors have to be the same size. So what happens geometrically in vector addition is this. If we have these two vectors, A and B, we add them together, we get this purple vector here. It's like we took, let's go in the top direction here. If we took the B vector and just placed it at the tip of A, where it terminates will be where the new vector happens to come from, right? So it's, it's like re, re, reconfiguring the space a little bit. Okay, so that's vector addition. Vector multiplication by scalar, all is also well in the world here. It works the way you think it would. All right, if we take, have a vector A and we multiply it by 2, the resulting vector is an element by element multiplication by that scalar. Right? So if A was 1, 2, if we multiply that by 2, the result is 2 times 1, or 2, in position 1, 1, and 2 times 2, or 4, in position 2, 1. So, that is, this is where the term scalar comes into play. Uh, the scalar multiplication changes the length of the vector. Right? So, before we saw the vector A had a length of 2 point, 2 point something or other. Dangerous for me to squint at my screen here. Length of A. You won't see this, but I will. 2.23. Length of B. 2.47. Or 4.47. The length of A is actually... Or length of B, the length of D is actually two times the length of A. Just brought it bigger. Okay. So, in data, where we see a scalar is what we're doing in homework right now. In a general linear model, the beta weight can be thought of as a scalar. Right? Because ultimately, you know, for a given observation, it's, it's not a matrix. But if we were to think of a matrix of data, that scalar would multiply all of the x's across all the people. So that's, that's where we see that. Here's what's happening in scalar multiplication. Uh, we can take a little vector and stretch it. Similarly, if we multiplied a vector by a number that was smaller than zero, smaller than one, 
but bigger than zero, we shrink it, right? We scale it backwards or shrink it down. If we multiply it by a negative number, guess what happens to it? It points the opposite direction, reflects across the diagonal. Right? So ge geometry again. Again, now this geometry might not be your thing. It's cool if it's not, just bear with me. Would it be accurate in that regard to say it reflects across the origin? Yeah, that would be a good way of putting it. I think that sounds good. Anybody doing math know better? That's good. Katrina says yes. <laughs> Sorry. I, uh, you, you've taught high school math, and I failed high school math. So I will refer to Katrina to answer the math questions on this. <laughs> Does that make me an, an imposter? Do any of you have imposter syndrome? You know what I'm talking about? Like we're like, oh, they're going to find out. I still have that too. Right? So I'm, I'm, I'm worried that you're going to find this out about me. So I'm just trying to let you know I failed high school math, so take that into your calculus, all right? I sort of wear that proudly now. Like, yeah, I failed it. I, <laughs> I really failed it, too. <laughs> Some people, like, get barely good enough. No, I really, like, 30% failed it, right? All right. Um, so now, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is linear combinations of vectors. You're probably like, what? Why do I want to hear about this? So if I have a set of vectors, x1, x2, and maybe we have k of these vectors, I could multiply each of them by a constant, right? And add them together and create a brand new vector y, right? So y would be the linear combination of a bunch of vectors themselves, right? So you can think about it. What what? determines this linear combination is the set of each of these scalars, a1 through ak. And all possible values of a1 through ak is something called the span of the vectors, right? There's only so many values that can be there, although we don't necessarily think about it. And we don't normally have to worry about spans or what we call vector spaces in this case. Um, mainly uh, where this shows up is in exploratory factor analysis, and I'm going to teach you that that's the devil, right? And you want to stay away from it, even if you love, like, if you're into the devil, you want to stay away from this version of the devil, right? <laughs> so I'm trying to acknowledge all religions and everything here, right? So, or even if you don't believe in the devil, this this might make you believe, right? So, sorry, I'm trying to make stat class a controversial topic again. <laughs> make America great again. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that is not an endorsement. Okay. Is that your slogan? <laughs> Make statistics great again. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be huge. <laughs> Sorry. Got to stop. Um, so where we see this, I've made this purposefully with X's and Y's because I want you to think that a regression analysis is a linear combination. All right? If we took all of our data and put it in Y, and we took each variable and had this x1 up through xk, it would look like a linear combination, right? The beta weights would be the a1 through ak, and you're probably thinking, hey, wait a minute, what, where's the intercept, right? Turns out if we let x1 just be a column of ones, then a1 would be the intercept. Right? So that's where it shows up, what we do. It also shows up in principal components, which we'll get to later in the class. But lin uh, why linear depend uh, combinations really are important aren't for like the study of them. That's less so. It's really to describe a linear dependency. A linear dependency, or you could say each of the x's, if x1 through xk are what we call linearly dependent, if we can find some values of a1 through ak that give us this sum equal to zero when all of these are not equal to zero, right? So it's easy to find, it's easy to go back here and say, oh yeah, what are the values of a1 through ak that make a zero on the, right, the right-hand side of this, right? Well, a1 through ak have to all be zero, fine. Aside from that case, if you can find another one where there's a zero, that's called a linear dependency. So case in point. Let's imagine we take a look at SAT total, all right? So we created this brand new variable, SAT total. And let's pretend we think we have three dimensions. We have SAT verbal, 
We have SAT math, and we have SAT total. All right, so there's three of them. So what I'm going to show you is those three dimensions are linearly dependent, right? Because we could say one times SAT verbal plus one times SAT math plus negative one times SAT total gives us a zero, right? What does that mean? It means there's a redundancy in our vectors. And you can see it here, right? SAT verbal plus SAT math gives us SAT total. So really, we don't have three pieces of information. We only have two. Does this sound familiar to you at all? Guess what happens to your regression analysis if you try to predict an outcome with all three of these in a model? The technical term is blows up. <laughs> or if you're from Nebraska, blowed up. It blowed up. Anyone from Nebraska? Okay, good. I live there. My dad's family is all from like the middle of Nebraska. I'm from California, but I went lived there, you know, went there to be with my wife and so forth. So I was like, yeah, let's do this. And it was a really bad experience. And so now I pick on <laughs> this terrible experience, <laughs> right? Like that movie Nebraska that came out, you know, the black, you know, with the, the old guys going to South Dakota. It was like me going there for gold, and it just didn't like a lotto ticket didn't work out anyway. Where you see this, it will blow up because these are multicollinear or collinear is what we call it, right? And if you ever heard of multicollinearity, it really, this definition is a linear dependency, right? They are very, <laughs> they're bad <laughs> for statistics. They, they stop you from having to do certain matrix products. You can't take a matrix inverse of things that come out of this. And those matrix inverses show up in a lot of our calculations. So that's where multicollinearity comes about. How are we doing? One thing I will note, a common critique I see in, uh, in you know, my, my point of view whenever I help people with papers that are not in statistics but in their area, I hear reviewers say, oh, but you, what about multicollinearity of your variables? My answer is always, did it blow up? If your answer was no, then don't worry about it. <laughs> multicollinearity will blow it up, right? You'll get things like standard errors of infinity, right? or variances of, you know, 100,000. That's not good. So um, I don't worry about it uh, because unless it's right at the limit, generally it's not going to be a problem. Right. Have you ever had that criticism or question asked of you? It usually shows up in cops defenses or master's defenses or things. Why not? Aren't you worried about multicollinearity in your data? Well, it ran, <laughs> right? If you do this model, it won't run. It won't work. It'll blow up. So. Okay. So uh, one of the last things I'm going to talk about with vectors is something called the dot product or the inner product of vectors. And that is sort of like a vector multiplication thing. Right? So the inner product, uh, often known as A dot B or A transpose B, is where we take the element by element combination uh, of our vectors and multiply them together. So from our example, uh, A and B, element one, one of A was one, element one, two, one of B was two, multiply those together, add it to two, element two, one of A and times element two, one of B, and that gives us eight. So in data, what this really refers to, the inner product um, is related to the angle between vectors. Uh, so the angle between those vectors that we talked about. And that is related to the correlation. Right? So when we look at an inner product, when we, ever, we see this type of term, we're going to see that, um, that our correlation shows up. And really, this is actually my bigger picture purpose of showing you vectors before we got into matrices, because this is a matrix product. And in matrices, in vector land, each of our vectors have the same number of rows and columns. Right? So whenever we did a matrix product, we could do it always, all the same rows and columns. They were all column vectors, usually, and then we just play with the, the side dimensions work out to make it work. Uh, 
one of the things you'll see here is this A transpose B. We're going to see that a little bit later on. To do matrix multiplication in general, the matrix on the left, the number of columns in it, has to be equal to the number of rows in the matrix on the right. That's the one stipulation about matrix multiplication. In vector dot products, it's always going to work out, but the matrices are not necessarily going to. So one of my motivations for putting this here is to get us thinking about what it's doing, but also to see that in the first pass as well. So here, if we wanted to talk about the angles between vectors, we could find it by taking a dot b, dividing it by the length of a times the length of b, and then taking the, here we go, inverse cosine of that. Inverse cosine, which, which side? <laughs> Let's say that again. You're going to go find the angle. That's right. You're going to find the angle between this, right? This is, again, back to Pythagorean theorem, right? So there's your angle between it. And we could see our angle here was 0.12 in our example, or 0.105, or 0.105 in our data itself. Turns out uh, the, cosine, the, the cosine angle is equal to the correlation, right? So if we just took that term in the middle here, right there, we come about and get correlation in our data. Right, so our data happened to be 0.775. So things to think about with cosine, I know we're up against a break, I'm just going to finish this real quick. Um, the angle, the correlation is when you can perfectly predict things, things fall on a line. It's like these two vectors come perfectly in correlation with each other in space. The opposite is when the vectors are what we call perpendicular, right? When they're like this, there's no correlation. It's like having a scatter plot. So that's where it happens to be. All right, let's uh, let's take a break because this next slide is even more fun, and then we'll dive into the, the rest of the class when we get back. <laughs>